talk about surgery. Thank you for coming, Robert. Well, it's difficult to, to, keep, to keep up to the expectations after such an introduction. I prefer to be the friend and the master anyway, so uh, please uh, do not try to spare me at the end if you do not agree with what I'm going to say. Uh, first, I, I, you can see here that I'm very proud to be part-time professor at the same university as Frank. And, uh, well, I have, uh, at, the, at the beginning of my career, I was very much involved in uh, arterial grafting. It is difficult to speak about advances to surgical treatment, but I will first very much underline the arterial grafts. I think it's not an advance. It should have been an advance, but I think it should now really go to arterial graft. Why? Because there are bi biochemical reasons. You know that the production of prostacycline by the endothelium of the arterial graft is protecting the patency of the graft. You know the vasomotoricity the saphenous graft is uh, just uh, immobile macaroni, uh, while the mammary artery uh, is playing with the shear stress of the endothelium. Even if, you, even if you take it free and modulate the flow according to, uh, modulate the, the, the diameter according to the flow keeping patency. And finally, you have the histology. And the histology, you know that in the mammary artery, the, the internal uh, elastic lamina is intact. So one of the first uh, pathway of atherosclerosis with the stimulation of the, of the muscular cells in the media migrating for fibrotic, for, for uh, hyperplastic, uh, uh, hyperplasia fibrosis of the endothelium is stopped by the mammary artery for two reasons. First, there is very little uh, muscular cell in the media of the mammary artery. And secondly, the elastic lamina interna is intact. And uh, I think it's important to see, this is a, a work of nearly 20 years ago when I was still in Saint Luc, you see here, uh, post-operatively about six months after the operation, you see that the mammary artery, uh, you see that the mammary artery is increasing the diameter if you increase the flow while the saphenous vein graft is an immobile macaroni. So I think you should really think about that when you speak about myocardial revascularization. And this is uh, uh, three examples of full arterial revascularization. It is also an old slide, but you see that the left mammary artery, uh, the left mammary artery is of course for the left side. Usually we use that for the anterior, for the anterior wall, diagonal and LAD. The right mammary artery, if you want to keep it pedicled, you can put it in the transverse sinus to the circumflex. But if you do that, you never reach, of course, the remote myocardium. And then if you do this constriction and you want to keep it arterial at that time, we were using the gastroprobic artery. So this is possible. It's a bit a pity to do that, to put the right mammary on the right coronary artery because it has been shown uh, by a German group that you have better results if you put both mammary artery on the left side. And this is something that we should not do anymore because I'm now in Genk uh, taking back to operation uh, quite frequently patients because they were using that before, before I came in gang, they were using uh, this uh, type of construction. But th the problem is that when the patient is getting old and is get going to get old, if you do a full arterial revascularization, you have to reoperate for an aortic stenosis or you have to reoperate for a mitral valve problem and then you, 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 you face a very difficult reoperation because the re-sternotomy is going to be uh, quite difficult because the right mammary artery going to the LAD is crossing under. So I can tell you, you have to take a very strong breakfast if you want to start a day like that. And this is what I'm doing now. And this is uh, really very interesting because I'm doing a I we are doing a Y constriction. And in fact, this is acting then as a left main because you have all the, 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 the myocardium which can, be, which can be revascularized. You take the free mammary artery, the right mammary right the, the, uh, on the free, and then you go with that to uh, the circumflex and even the right, and then you do the Y anastomose. And personally, I do that at the end because I don't want to be committed. Mo most of the surgeons, they start by doing that. And then if they start by doing that, sometimes they don't reach it yet. 
But if you have a very enlarged heart, you can, you can get to there, and then your left mammary artery, you leave it a bit longer to bake the anastomosis there. So I think one of the clues to do that systematically is to uh, perform this anastomosis last. This is the German paper showing that if you put the right mammary artery on the left side, you have a better result at long term uh, than if you put the right mammary artery on the right side. This is uh, something that we have published long time ago. It is just to show you that we have uh, observed 500 patients for 10 years with a very nice follow-up, with excellent result. And you see here, very importantly, that uh, after 10 years, you have only 3.1% of the patients having an iterative free vascularization, 0.8 for the CABG and PTCA 2.3. It means that it is 0.31% per year. So if you apply that type of strategy, you are really effective in uh, uh, preventing uh, re-ischemia re of the patient. And these are the two curves. This is the, the freedom from angina, but we know that the freedom from angina is not really very uh, obvious, and I think you should look more at the freedom of any cardiac event. But if you see uh, in this type of patients that you can go very long uh, to have before you have, again, a problem. Patency is extremely good. This is really at about nine years, uh, 7.5 years mean, uh, but up to 12.2 years, and you see that uh, you have a fantastic patency uh, if you use bilateral mammary artery, and it's true for the single, but also for the sequential. It's not because you do sequential grafting that you're going to have a less uh, permeability, and you see the saphenous vein cannot compete with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the arterial graft, uh, generally speaking. And this is just to show you that you're going to, to read in the literature that the right mammary artery is less good than the left mammary artery. This is absolutely bullshit because if you look here, you see that the, the right mammary artery, if you put it on the left side, has exactly the same patency than the left mammary artery. So the right mammary artery is a, is a very important conduit to use in revascularization. Uh, is two mammary better than one? Well, this is, has been illustrated by this paper of the, of the Cleveland Clinic a time ago, and you see that as, as much as for the reoperation and as for the survival, bilateral mammary artery is better than one mammary artery. And ask your surgeon to do skeletonized mammary artery, because if you use skeletonized mammary artery, you won't have a sternal problem. Uh, when, I, when I started the bilateral pedicle mammary artery with a wide pedicle, I had up to 5% of sternal problem. And since then, I'm using skeleton eyes, so I take just the mammary artery naked uh, on both sides. You have less bleeding, less uh, uh, trauma behind the sternum, and we eliminated nearly completely the sternal problem, as you will see. Uh, the problem of... Uh, the problem of... Uh, uh, with the right mammary artery, you see that we are not the only one who, who say that, and the group of Buxton who have published a lot about the, the, the arterial graft, they still, uh, after the, 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 they were the promoters of the, uh, of the radial artery. Personally, I'm convinced that the radial artery is somewhat better than the phrenic nerve as a bypass. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, you, you see that even this group who was pushing the radial artery is coming back and saying the routine use of both internal thoracic artery. So I insist on it. If you speak about revascularization, you should go for, uh, most of the time, uh, fully act of, uh, bilateral mammary artery graft. This is the point that we should better discuss, and this is more and more insisted now. Excellent patency on the left side for the, the, the anterior wall and the lateral wall, but you see that uh, here in the, in the remote myocardium, I would say, the, 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 the distal circumflex and the right, the patency is much less interesting. And you can have, this is again the, 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 what we published about 10 years ago, you can, if you do sequential venous graft on the remote area, means distal circumflex and right, you do not have anymore a very significant patency difference between mammary artery and sequential venous uh, saphenous graft. 
and uh, is, this is a, a, another paper of uh, the Cleveland Clinic showing that the Riconary artery with less than 70% stenosis is probably be better off with the saphenous vein graft. And you, uh, I will, you, you will see later on, you will hear later on how I propose to solve this problem. Uh, again, if you look at the, the Riconary artery system, you should, th these are two uh, uh, papers of uh, angiographic predictors of six months patency and the other one of three years patency by David Liner, who is one of the young surgeons in Brussels. And if you look at that, you see that the minimal lumen diameter before the operation has a major influence on patency. As long as you have a very severe stenosis, of course the arterial graph are better, but if you have a moderate stenosis uh, on visual inspection, uh, at that time, a uh, saphenous vein graft might be better. Now, the conclusion is that you have a better correlation with the minimal lumen diameter than with the visual uh, uh, estimation. You have uh, uh, the, the point that the saphenous vein graft is not dependent on the minimal lumen diameter, uh, the, while the um, arterial grafts are. And then, of course, if you are on the right side and you have an MLD more than 1.1, uh, saphenous vein graft provides a better uh, option. Now, this is uh, the situation in the remote area. This is the right gastropathic artery, the left mammary artery, the free mammary artery, and the radial artery. These are the drawbacks. I mean, you should not use a mammary artery on a right coronary artery which is not severely occluded. And per occlusion, maybe we should for the remote area, second saphenous graft or PTCA. The clue is the patient factors, as explained by uh, Laura Mori. We have to not to look only on the, on the coronary artery, we have to look at the patients, we have to look at the target, target vessels consideration. And if you look here in the, low, in the last uh, uh, guidelines, European guidelines would, would have been elaborated uh, together with cardiologists and surgeons, you see here that uh, it is very important to uh, put arterial grafting everywhere, even in the, in the outside of the LED. Uh, and uh, of course, it is, it is a, a class one recommendation with a small reserve about the right coronary artery. Uh, this is what we do now in Henk. Uh, you see that we are putting arterial graft, at least one arterial graft in the vast majority of the patient. And you see that the patient only receiving arterial vascularization if the age is 65 or less, is 83.3%. And you see that the number of anastomoses is 3.5 and 64 of them are arterial. So I think it is absolutely important if you have to operate to do arterial revascularization. And this is also very important. You have seen that we have a small reserve about the remote myocardium. This is the, op the, the solution. And I'm very glad that Laura has initiated the subject because we have to go we have to abandon being uh, blind plumbers, and we have to go and, and, and bypass the, the graphs who are really uh, important on ischemia and on the runoff. So this is a very, very important clue, and you see that we have set the limit to 0 0.75. Uh, for this reason, this is a paper from Nico Pels uh, from Eindhoven. He published in the New England Journal of Medicine. You see that if you use the stress test, the thallium scan of the stress echocardiography, and you relate it to the FFR, you see that 0.75 is really at the limit of significance. So I think this is very important to know. And these are the illustration of three situations where you can act differently according to the FFR, the same stenosis, but you have here a 0.7, you should do it. Here you have 0.5 with a self stenosis. Why? Because you have collateral circulation, making the distal pressure higher and making your FFR, which is then negative. And here you have the same lesion, no collateral, but a scar with a poor runoff. And you see that this vessel should not be bypassed. Now, if you want to go for full arterial revascularization, if you have a doubt about your remote myocardium, the remote area, if you have a doubt about the right coronary artery, the clue is, of course, doing the FFR. And there has been already publication with FFR. Uh, this is the, the same group of Eindhoven with Nicopels, the stenosis severity of native valve influenced bypass graft patency. Yes, it does. This is uh, 
the group of patients with uh, intermediate lesion at visual inspection, you see that they have split it after that the patient with FFR with significant FFR, not significant, and you see that the occlusion is double. So it's not only uh, uh, true it for the FAME study for the PCI, it is also true in surgery. So if you are uh, uh, in doubt about a lesion, I think we should do FFR systematically. And this is what happens if you use the visual inspection stenosis severity, you have not a real uh, uh, harmonious li uh, line, while if you use the FFR, you see that uh, it is really very significantly correlated. This is what the indications for, uh, for coronary bypass surgery versus per per percutaneous coronary intervention. You see that it's not surprising that uh, for one and two vessel disease and non-proximal LED, you should, of course, go for PCI. Even in this one, you should discuss with the cardiologist. I do not agree so much that 1A and 2AB. I think this is already starting the discussion and triple vessel disease, we will see that there we go more for surgery. And in left main, we are part of the Excel study, and we are uh, certainly randomizing uh, left main in low uh, uh, syntax score, and I think the results will be uh, non very recent uh, 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 in a few years. So now, uh, the, these are the four years uh, subset, four years uh, syntax trial subset, in triple vessel disease, I think you should be aware and you know that if you look at the cardiac death at four years, it is nearly the double, it's more than the double, and it's uh, highly significant uh, for PCI versus the cardiac surgery. So I think in a triple vessel disease, there must be a discussion between the team, and I think most of the time we should probably go to surgery. I say most of the time, not all the time. And this is also for myocardial infarction. You see that there is a difference at four years. And what is important is to see that it, it is increasing. The difference is increasing with time. If you look at the CVA, it is the same. And there we have to make both an effort, certainly in PCI and certainly also in surgery. I think one of the clues is to use arterial grafting. I will, I will show you that. If you look at all causes of death, again, a superiority of the surgery with a very significant uh, uh, difference. And if you look at the maze, of course, there you have the influence of the repeat revascularization, also a difference. And particularly, particularly in the intermediate and in the high score. This is what Laura said. In low score, I think you have to discuss with the cardiologist, but if you have a, a, a score of, of uh, a uh, syntax score of between 23 and 32, you see that the difference is highly significant. And in high score above 33, I think the discussion is not even existing at the present time. Now, uh, extremist people in cardiac surgery like David, David Taggart uh, are, are pompously concluding that the time for coronary artery bypass to make a comeback. I think the comeback is maybe possible for some subtract, subset of the patients, but I think we have to be continuously uh, making the equipoise in every center between cardiologists and cardiac surgeons to offer the patient the better solution. And this is an interesting paper we just published in the Journal of Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery. A lot of patients, 1,497,000 patients in the, in, the summer, in the Society of Thoracic Surgery database. What is the, the evolution between 2000 and 2009? Well, first, we see that the patients are better treated. They are better treated for diabetes mellitus, hypertension. They take aspirin, beta blockers, angiotensin, conversin, ACE inhibitors, and use of statin. So Laura has uh, alluded on that for the medical treatment, but you see that after a cardiac surgery uh, also, uh, there is absolutely a need for treating the patient medically after the surgery. And you see that the observed mortality rate of this period declined from 2.4 to 1.9. Postoperative score decreased from 1.6 to 1.2. And the incidence of tenal wound infection is uh, uh, obviously much better. And you see that, of course, the, 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 the stents are improving, but the surgeons are also improving. This is, this is a STS database. This is not really selective cardiac surgery, but you see that we are improving the surgeons, even if they are not included in a trial where they do absolutely their utmost best, you see that 
the mortality is decreasing, the stroke is decreasing, the renal failure is decreasing, the reoperation for bleeding is decreasing, the deep sternal wound infection is decreasing, and it's even more so if you use bilateral mammary artery because you do not come to the aorta, you just clamp the aorta, but you do not put the side branch, the side clamp to perform the, anas the proximal anastomosis of the vein, and this is what we, what we have now in my unit in 2008 and 2011, you see that the stroke is 0.9%. And this is for all open heart patients. If you look only for the isolated CABG, 0.4%. So it has not only an influence on the revascularization, it has an influence on the results. You see the mediastinite is 0.4%. And I think this is uh, also a consequence of this pathology. So it is recommended that patients be adequately informed about the potential benefits and short-term and long-term risk. And I think which is very important, and maybe the most important conclusion of my talk, is that there must be an equipoise between the cardiac team, cardiac surgeon, and cardiologist. This is what I wanted to uh, show you today. Thank you. <clears throat> I am afraid uh, Dr. Maury has to leave because she has a driver waiting to, to, the, to go to the airport. Uh, Laura, thank you very much, and uh, we hope to have the chance to discuss a little bit more with you. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Robert. So uh, it was very good, as always. Uh, questions for uh, Dr. Dion? Please. Can you have the mic? Good morning. What do you think about uh, hybrid pro uh, procedures, uh, cabbage and PCI? S sorry, I, do not, I didn't. No, what do you think about the usefulness of hybrid procedures, uh, combining cabbage and PCI? You said, you said oh, combined hybrid procedure. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I think uh, this is uh, something which had, uh, which has. I, I was allergic to this, uh, to this situation for a long, long time. I think now we we should evolve in this direction. Certainly, with the with the help of the FFR. I think personally that if you have a right coronary artery with a 40, 50 percent stenosis, I believe that you have seen even if you use arterial grafts that the patency at long term is not perfect. So in this case, particularly for the right coronary artery. I would really prefer if you have 40, 50 percent stenosis, if your FFR is dead at the limit, I think it's probably a good idea to ask the surgeons to put arterial graft on the left side and you come with the last generation sent on the right coronary artery. On top of it, in the last ATS, American Association for Thoracic Surgery, there was a group of Australia showing that the that the evolution of the stenosis on the right side is much slower than on the left side. So I'm certainly for the distal circumflex and the right, I would be now very much accessible to a hybrid solution where you do, uh, you do what we can do less good and, and you, you, you do that with a stand, but with excellent results. So I think the FFR is going to change the, the data and the, the attitude. So I think it's welcome. More questions? I have one for you. Practical thing. After the stand for life, uh, and yesterday we saw it. Um, if you go to the target vessel uh, and you only do a PCI on the LED, for instance, a few weeks later, and most of those patients are three vessel disease, you get into a situation where you have two vessel, two vessel disease, and one which is a stented vessel, where if you do a FFR, probably you are not going to get, uh, or you are going to get. Uh, uh, no stenosis, in fact, or no functional ischemia there. What to do? You, you need to revascularize the other lesions, which are uh, ischemic, and you have a stent over there. Uh, it's becoming a, a, a problem uh, sometimes. Uh, what to do? You are going to spoil the left uh, internal mammary artery into a place where the patency maybe is not going to be very high because you have an open vessel and it's going to be. Uh, 
No, certainly not. I think uh, when, when the cardiologist is putting a stent in an evolving infarction, he's, sa he's saving muscle. Uh, is saving muscle and probably also the future. So I think we have to defend this, this approach. I think this is a very logical approach. And then if you do that in my department uh, and in Leiden when I was there, uh, we, we try to wait at the maximum before the surgery is coming. We try to wait six months. We try to wait for one year. And then you have, you are sh nearly sure if the stent is going to, to be open or not. Uh, and then, of course, there is no way that we're going to put the mammary artery on the LED uh, if the stent is a success after six months of one year. Now, if you have to operate because you have an ischemia in the remote myocardium, I think the surgeon cannot possibly put a, put a mammary artery on a, on a, on a LED which is, uh, which is uh, successfully stented. I think we have to take the chance about the possibly restenose of the stent. It's just bad luck. But I think with the, with the new uh, techniques evolving, uh, that type of situation is going to be more and more rare to degenerate in, uh, in a problem of the LED. So personally, I would, uh, I would not touch this LED anymore. Certainly not because I'm doing this uh, Y connection because then you're going to have a, uh, an enormous uh, steel uh, from one branch of the, of the Y connection to the other one. So I wouldn't. Thank you. Another question. In, sorry, in, in, in these cases that you wait uh, six or 12 months, do you always repeat uh, catheterization or if the patient has been asymptomatic, you, you rely on a non-invasive test of ischemia? Well, I think I think we should not uh, recatheterize the patient every time. I think we can we, we can use a CT scan, we can use a, a stress test, you can use you can use many things for viability. And now with the new imaging CT scan, you can you can follow that very accurately. So I wouldn't repeat catheterization all the time. Uh, for a question, I, I am sure that many of these the cardiologists here have in mind the problem of the high dependency of the surgical results of the center and the operators. You, know? you have the Sintas trial, which is very good, but when you have your results in your own center, your surgeons, and you see that are not fully uh, reproduced, and, uh, then uh, PCI is more dependent on the device. PCI procedure is more reproducible because usually the stents perform well and the operation is more less dependent of the technique of the, of the operator, but in surgery, you, you many times listen, ah, oh, my mortality is this, my mortality is this, my full arterial revascularization is this, my full arterial is this. A full arterial revascularization goes from 5% to 40%. Mortality in the national registry is going from centers with 1%, 2%, and centers that are providing results around 10%, 8% mortality. And then when you have the patient and you have a three vessel disease, uh, you will like maybe with a high medium, mid synthesis score to send to surgery, but uh, sometimes you listen, now it depends on the surgeon that is going to operate this case. Uh, it is, and in the center, uh, sometimes the decision, and not always you have the best. We have good surgery in most of the centers, but uh, I think the problem is also that the surgeons are doing less surgery now. The young surgeon, the young uh, fellows in cardiovascular surgery are doing fewer and fewer cabbage cases per year because uh, the staff is the staff, eight sergeants or seven sergeants in the, in the hospital, but they are doing isolated cabbage only for seven, 60 cases per year, 70 cases in many centers in Spain. And this means that they are doing one cabbage per month or two. This is really why I say that the guidelines are, are not a Ferrari. The guidelines are a nice Peugeot, you know, and I have nothing against the Peugeot but it is not illustrating the maximum. And that's why uh, that type of experience, of course, uh, I, I was very excited by arterial grafting, so uh, I, I developed that a lot. I'm doing much less uh, coronaries now than other stuff as uh, Jose-Louis Pomar has said. So what you say is perfectly true. That's why the solution is to make an equipoise in every center. I think you should know the results of your surgeon. The surgeon should know your results. And then you will have a white zone, a black zone, where it's obvious that you should PCI or surgeon. And then you have the gray zone. And the gray zone varies from center to center. We know in Henk and in the particular situation, they can perfectly do a PCI and we discuss it. And in fact, in our staff, we are discussing 
only the gray zone. We don't discuss anymore the black zone and the white zone. We discuss the gray zone. And the gray zone is going to be different from center to center. And I think for the patient, it makes a big difference if the gray zone is well understood and supported by both sides. So guidelines are to be used just as a condiment, you know, like pepper and salt. But the food is, is, is going to be made by, by locally by, by, by a, a center. And I would accept totally that the gray zone is moving center by center. Absolutely. Malcolm. I'll try to make this uh, brief. First of all, I, I really enjoyed uh, listening uh, to your presentation and to your perspective. Uh, as you know, there is a uh, big move um, you know, across the world for using more transradial approaches for coronary angiography. And although you only briefly uh, mentioned uh, radiographs uh, in your uh, presentation, could you give us uh, a brief insight into what your opinion is or what the evidence is with respect to using the radial artery subsequent to uh, a transradial angiogram in terms of patency? Well, I'm not a fan of the radial artery. Nobody would take mine, certainly not. The people saying that they have no problem, uh, I ask them why are you never using the right but using the left? Why are you using the right if the patient is leftist and why do you use it? So uh, the right, the, the radial artery, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give mine. Second point, the radial artery is very muscular. You know it because sometimes it's difficult to prick it because directly there is a lot of uh, muscular cells and uh, you know that the muscular cells is uh, something which is uh, giving uh, uh, way to atherosclerosis. So personally, I must be really with my back against the wall before I use a radial artery. Now, people having uh, 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 using radial artery a lot, and of course the radial artery is much easier than the mammary artery because the radial artery, you can, if your name is Dion, you can write the, my name on the epicardium of the heart. It's very big. The mammary artery is like that. You must be inventive strategically. So that's why the people are using radial artery. And they have a length, and they can say, oh, I did all arterials. And if you look at the results of the, of the radial artery based on angiographic results, they're not much better than the saphenous graft. So personally, on angiographic results, not clinical results, they're not much better than the... And the radial artery needs a, 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 a high runoff. Uh, these are many, many conditions. So I know a few friends who are using the radial artery profusely, and they pretend that even if the patient has had catheterization through the radial artery, they still can use them. But I'm afraid that there is no real uh, publication on the subject uh, to, to illustrate that. But personally, if you use the, the Y connection, skeletonized, because if you skeletonize the mammary artery, you win length. If you use that, in my practice, the need for something else is extremely rare. 